This is Radiance tape number JD34, recorded in February 1972. Two short messages by Jim Durkin. Side one is entitled, Effective Prayer. I'd like you to turn with me to James, the fifth chapter. Thirteenth verse, Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Now, as we continue to read here, you're going to get the idea that prayer is a mighty important part of the Christian's life. And yet, in spite of the fact that it is, a good many people are, by the nature of their own spirits, unprepared to pray. They are, by the nature of their own training, uninstructed in how to pray or what to pray for. And so much of their prayer life is totally wasted. So what we're looking forward to is an understanding of how we cooperate with God's divine purposes in this life. God has a plan for our lives. He wants me. He wants you. He wants his body everywhere to truly reflect the life of Jesus Christ himself. It is not me merely accepting religion. It is not me merely agreeing to a code of ethics, which if that's all this book were, you can find in many books of ethics, ethics every bit is good. They tell you not to murder people, tell you that you should love people, tell you that you should not steal, that you should be kind, that you should, and all of the ethical principles that you can find here you can find elsewhere. It is not the ethical principles of this book that makes this book what it is. It is the person that this book talks about that makes this book have value or meaning. Now, Jesus, if we merely recognize him as a good person, we can even recognize him as the son of God. We can go further than that and recognize that he is almighty God, but truly the son of God. There's God the father, at least this is what the word seems to teach me. Some may think differently. But nevertheless, the point is, we can recognize him as God. We can recognize him as the only begotten son of God. We can recognize him as savior. We can recognize him as Lord and say, all right, Lord, what is it you want me to do? Well, I want you to do so-and-so. Maybe I'd read it in the Word, or maybe some preacher would tell me, the Lord wants you to do so-and-so. All right, Lord, I will go and do it. And of course, I always fell short. I could not accomplish God's purposes in my life. Because it is not me doing what Jesus wants me to do. It is him living his life through me. He wants to accomplish something. He wants to do something. I am the vehicle by which he will express himself in this world. So it is not me, independent James Durkin, who listens to the Lord, independent Lord Jesus, instructing me that he wants me to do something. And I say, all right, Lord, I've heard you. I will go and do it. In the first place, I have the foggiest notion of how to do the simplest thing that God would want done. You don't know, I don't know, how to do anything that God wants done. I don't know how to give effectively. I don't know how to receive effectively. I'm a very poor receiver of somebody doing or giving me a blessing. I'm a very poor, I would much rather be a giver. But I recognize that that's a weakness, a flaw in my character. And therefore, many times the Lord has had to stop me up short and say to me that I was to get out of the way he wanted to receive. And he did receive through me. And then to give. I don't know how to give. I'm a poor witnesser. I, how would you witness and tell anybody what has happened in you? Can you describe the change? Can you tell people what's happened? Can you tell them of the miracle and make them understand who you were, what you were, what you did? You cannot do it. The simplest thing you cannot do. But Jesus knows what he did in you. And he knows what he did through you. And therefore, if you step back and know something that it isn't Jesus there, we take what the scripture says literally to be true. It is Christ in us. The hope of glory. 
He lives in me. Well, sometimes we have a picture, if we go that far, like there's a little room inside of us, and we say, he lives in my heart. Well, that's all right. That's true, if you understand what the heart is. But a lot of people actually picture it, and they put their hands, say, he lives in my heart. And we put our hand over our physical organ called the heart. And we picture Jesus somehow living in there. And, and that's better than think of him living up there. But it's not living in us in the sense of just kind of rooming there. He is united with us. His spirit is moving through us. Now when he was upon the earth, the things that he did, the Bible says Jesus was the direct and perfect expression of God. He expressed God because God was in him speaking to the world through him. The Bible says God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Now the things that Jesus did were an expression of what was in the heart of God. So that he directly expressed the mind and the action of God had God taken upon himself human form, God the Father that is. In this case God the Son took upon human form and God the Father was in him expressing himself through Jesus Christ. Now let's see what Jesus did when he was upon the earth. One of the things that he did was he prayed. Let's take a look at what it says here in the fifth chapter. Please notice that God is instructing this man James who is an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ to tell people to pray he says are you afflicted what should you do pray is any sick among you let him call for the elders of the church and let them do what pray or oh, anoint with oil to be sure but pray and the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up now what kind of a prayer was that prayer of faith now you can't pray that kind of a prayer, and I can't pray that kind of a prayer. And I only know one individual in the whole wide universe that can pray that kind of a prayer. Who's that? Jesus can pray that kind of a prayer. He has that faith. Now I do not need my faith. I need his faith. If I'm going to pray an effective prayer, I must merely be the vehicle, not passive, not merely sitting back and say, here I am, I'm a body, and you take over. Well, not that. Actively cooperating with the Lord, totally united with Him, completely surrendered, and yet not the surrender of just passiveness. Like, not that kind of surrender. The surrender of a man truly submitted to the purposes of God in his life. Lord, you are in me. Use me. I'm with you. Whatever you want me to do, Lord, I'm yours. See, not the submission of passiveness. Many Christians sit back and say, I just let the Lord do anything he wants. He never does anything at all. Because that's not the kind of submission that the Bible, it's active submission. Lord, I am submitted, and now I'm ready to do your work. So, here the Lord is talking about the elders. Must pray the prayer of faith. Well, that's the prayer of Jesus praying through them. And there's no other kind of prayer that's effective. He goes on to say here, to confess your faults one to another and pray one for another. I want you to pray for me. What am I supposed to do? Pray for you. And what are you supposed to do? Only pray for me? Am I supposed only to pray for you? Or are we to pray for each other? Paul tells us in another place, he said, I will that men lift up holy hands everywhere, praying one for another, praying for the rulers, praying for this, praying for that. Pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converted a sinner from the error of his way shall save his soul from death, and shall hide a multitude of sins. Now here's a strong encouragement. Pray when you're afflicted. Get prayer when you're sick. Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another. You may be healed of those faults and of your sicknesses. And he says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And then he goes on to tell us how much. 
And he said Elijah was a man of like passions as we are. Now that means then he gets tired. And that means that he's subject to becoming angry at times if he's pushed hard enough. Bible says, be ye angry and sin not, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Philip said, don't let the devil get any kind of a stronghold like that in your life by continuing to hold a grudge. Wipe it out of your life, but it's possible that you can become angry for a time, for a moment, and then it will pass. Like passions, we can become discouraged, we can become tired, we can become weary, all kinds of things, we can be disappointed. Elijah was a man like that. But the Bible says, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Brother, sister, I am thankful to God that my righteousness does not depend upon anything that I do. But my righteousness depends upon what Jesus Christ is doing, number one, for me, number two, in me, number three, through me. He is doing it. Oh, and my behavior patterns have changed tremendously in the last 25 years. I think the most remarkable thing I've ever seen is people that have had ideas, prejudices, concepts for 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Habits ingrained in them, totally a part of their personality and being. And come to Jesus Christ and say, Lord, come into me. Unite with my life. Take over my life. Begin to live through me, Lord Jesus. And to see those habits and ideas and concepts fall in a moment of time. And a whole new personality began to emerge. What personality? Their personality? Some hidden personality that they had? No, my friends. Not their personality at all. But Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me hallelujah it was the personality of jesus that began to emerge in paul's life and everywhere that that man when he said just giving us an example just as god was in christ reconciling the world unto himself he said so we pray you in christ stead be ye reconciled unto god he knew that that divine personality which moved men to jesus christ was not him but it was God in him that was moving men to Jesus Christ. And so likewise, what is making this work work? Why are people being saved? Why are people turning from drugs and from concepts and false religions and ideas? Why are they turning from sin to God in ever increasing numbers? Because you're realizing that God is in you. That Jesus is living not only in you, but through you. And now the Bible said, if you realize these things, pray. For he said, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much in its working. Hallelujah. Go back with me, please, to the 17th chapter of the book of John. Jesus prayed. And he believed that his father would hear him. He said, Father, I know that you hear me always. Because I do those things which are right in your sight. Hallelujah. I tell you something, I know my prayers are heard. Not the ones that I pray amiss, but I've learned not to pray prayers amiss. By the grace of God, my heart has been trained to pray the prayer that God lays upon my heart. And I say to you this morning, learn how to get God's mind and then pray in that spirit. Now Jesus knew he was going to the cross. The time of his departure was nearing at hand. And his soul was stirred within him. His spirit was mightily moved upon. His spirit cried out to be delivered of some great prayer that was being born deep in the very depths of his nature. God was in Christ reconciling the world in himself, to himself. God was in Christ speaking to the world. The Bible says God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past to the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us in his son. He spoke through his son. Now he's getting ready through this vehicle, the vehicle of his son perfectly devoted, perfectly submitted to him. He stirs up his spirit and the Lord said, I am greatly troubled. I want to pray. And then he began to pray. He didn't pray his own prayer. He didn't sit down, think up things and say, well, I think now what I'm going to do is pray a few prayers here and, and tell my heavenly father what I want done for the next 2,000 or 
5,000 years and I'm going to give them a few instructions about how to run the universe. Some people are so foolish in this way. Not that they're not foolish wickedly. They're foolish because they've never been trained. They sit down tell God what kind of a day they want tomorrow and, and what kind of food they want on the table and when they want to get a promotion and they want God to do this and God, well, kind of like he's an errand boy. You see, the whole purpose of God's dealing with the world is to carry out their instructions. See, and now they've gotten saved, Lord, and now you owe me something, right? Owe him something? We owe God everything that we are, everything that we ever will be. I tell you something, we had blown every right to anything we ever had. We forfeited, we sinned it, we've hocked our souls completely, we've sold our souls to the devil, and we had nothing and were nothing. And then God in his infinite mercy sent his only begotten son out of pure grace. You know what grace means? Unmerited favor. Sent his son down to die on the cross of Calvary and bore my sins and I wasn't even yet born. Now, you know it's something. To, here's a man who has sinned in the past. It's one thing to forgive a man who has sinned. You see? And you do something for him and you say, well, all right, Joe, you sin and it's a bad thing that you've done. But man, I've had time to have this thing healed in my heart and now I'm going to forgive you for it. It's easy to, but I tell you something, God was looking down 2,000 years from the birth and the death and the sacrifice of his son to a guy by the name of James Durkin and saw that one day a man by that name would be born and that man would sin yet. And not only would I sin, yet I sinned against knowledge. And not only did I sin against knowledge, but everyone here sinned against knowledge. And God saw that you would do it, knew that you would do it. And yet the Bible says, for God so loved the world 2,000 years hence that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him would never perish but would have everlasting life and here his divine son is getting ready to go to the cross and to die for a church full of people yet unborn for a world full of people that were yet unborn and were going to sin in the future and Jesus says I feel troubled that I've got to pray and he kneels down and he begins to pray and here's what he prays father the hour is come Glorify thy son. You think he's praying as himself? God is urging him to pray. He's praying God's prayer for him. Here's what I want you to pray, son. He doesn't know how to pray. You don't know how to pray. I don't know how to pray. Thank God the Spirit of God knows how to pray. The Bible says he searches the deep things of the heart of God. And then he reveals them unto us. That's how I know what to pray. Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son that thy son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal that they might know thee the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou what? Thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me. Notice this perfect flowing of God through him. And they have received them and have known surely that I came out from thee. And they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou gavest me. For they are thine. And all mine are thine. And thine are mine. And I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world. But these are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father. Keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now I come to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou should take them out of the world, but that thou shouldst keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. 
Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, listen to this, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Hallelujah. That they all may be one, even as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee. That they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou give, hast given me. For thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name, and I will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. That divinely inspired prayer, 2,000 years nearly has gone by since that prayer was prayed. This book has been burned a million times. His ministers of the gospel have been slain with a sword and butchered and tortured. His people have been crucified and crushed and a thousand indignities and tortures and brutalities have been put upon them. All over the world today in countries outside of the United States and I suppose in some measure in the United States but certainly outside of it. Christians today are being butchered and killed for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Isn't it an amazing thing that 2,000 years later this prayer divinely inspired by Almighty God and prayed by Jesus Christ is still being answered with ever greater power since it has been prayed. The point that I want to bring to you this morning is that prayer is probably the single most effective action that you can perform. It is more important than preaching the gospel, not that preaching should cease. It is more important than witnessing, and yet you know how strongly I feel about witnessing. It is more important than work. And yet you know how strongly I feel about work and it ought to go on. Work must go on, witnessing must go on, preaching must go on. Everything that we do must go on. But undergirding every bit of it, this body, and the spirit is beginning to move in this direction, this body must become a praying, interceding body of people. Must become that. Amen. Now, if it becomes that, then I guarantee you this, what you have seen in the last year will be nothing but a bag of tail compared to what God will do in the coming years that are ahead. Hallelujah. Jesus prayed, Peter prayed, Paul prayed, John prayed, James prayed, Elijah prayed, Moses prayed, Daniel prayed. And these men had a reputation. It was said of James that one of his nicknames was Camel Knees. Because he was on his knees so long and so often that the knee surfaces became calloused with thick calluses. Because he waited before the Lord in prayer. He prayed. The Bible said Elijah prayed and the heavens held the rain for three and a half years. And he prayed again and God gave rain. And what it doesn't say, and you'll have to read the story for yourself, that he held back the rain, he brought the rain, but the result of it was a nation came back to God because he prayed. I don't know what God's plan is for this nation, but I tell you, wouldn't it be a glorious thing? If by your prayers and the prayers of thousands of other saints everywhere that are learning for the first time to raise their hands in effectual fervent prayer, this nation came back to God. Oh, it's not too late. Not too late. I don't know what God will do in the future, but I tell you this. 
I know that the very fact that I don't know is the most glorious and wonderful thing of it all. That our God is a God of infinite power and infinite surprise and infinite ability. But what he is looking for, and he tells in the Old Testament this is true. He tells about a nation that had gone away from God. He tells a nation that was ruined and horrible. And he told all of the terrible sins that they committed. Read just like the United States. But I read it to you. You say, what a thing, say, same thing's happening in our country. And then God goes on to say, and I look for a man to stand in the gap and to make up the hedge. And I found none. Therefore, my wrath and my fury were poured out upon them. But the very gist of that message that God gave is this. And there are many people that are going around today, and I tell you, they're making a terrible mistake. It is true that if America continue, continues in her sinful path, that she is headed for certain destruction. There's no, no question that the Word of God lays down a strong principle, says the wicked shall be turned into hell, and all nations that forget God. And righteousness exalted the people, but sin is a reproach to, and righteousness exalted the nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. But I'm going to tell you something here. God gives us the message in that great story that he gave, that he looked for a man to stand in the gap and make up the hedge, and he found none, therefore he destroyed him. What he really said was, if I had found a man, then I could have brought that nation back. He found a man in the person of Jonah, who Jonah was not particularly fond of the Ninevites and really didn't want to do the will of God. It took some work on God's part to get him ready to do the will of God. But when he got ready, he came to the Ninevites, this great, wicked, and terrible nation, and he began to preach to them after much prayer in that whale's belly. But brother, he prayed. I tell you, he prayed when he was down there. And I hope that God doesn't have to get us in that kind of a place before we start praying. No, it's starting now, and it's starting voluntarily. And there's a rising, swelling glory that's beginning to come upon the body as they're beginning to pray with power in the Lord Jesus Christ. But the Bible tells us that Jonah went to that town and he began to preach now. Something different about his preaching. Yet 40 days and God will overthrow this wicked nation. And the Bible said the king heard it and the servants heard it and the people heard it. And from the king right on down. As a matter of fact, the king got so, so repentant. Hallelujah. That he even demanded that the cattle fast and he put sackcloth and ashes on them. And he said, let everything fast in this nation. It may be that God will turn himself and repent of his good evil doing. I don't know what God's going to do in this nation, but I'll tell you this. Whether he saves one or he saves a million or he saves 200 million, I pray that this one thing be true. That you be an instrument of prayer in the hands of God to accomplish his purposes. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Stand with me, please. Hallelujah. Shalom Arimokus Sunday. Lord, we are your instruments, Lord. And we know of a surety that you are living in us, Lord. But it is more than that, you're living through us, Lord. And your purposes are being accomplished in this earth through your people. For we are the body of Christ. There is a universal body, but we are a body of Christ. And here we are, Lord. We are at your disposal. Join not only with this body, but with every other body of Christ, Lord. Everywhere, throughout the world, Lord. Let us all catch the single common vision, Lord, to accomplish your purposes in the earth. And Lord, to understand that we don't know how to pray as we ought, but your Holy Spirit moving through us, searching out the deep things of your heart, Lord, will lay them upon us and cause us to pray those prayers. And Lord, if we merely have to pray with groanings which cannot be uttered, so be it, Lord. You will understand and you'll respond. Hallelujah. Now let this spirit of prayer spread over our whole body, Lord. And then let it spread over every body of Christ in this community, Lord. Let there become a praying going up in this whole county, Lord. The like of which this world has never seen before. Let it be divine reality, Lord. Let prayer meetings like we've heard of before. Let them begin, Lord. Let businessmen stop their business and pray. Let working men find time to pray. Let housewives find time to pray. Let young people find find time and let them pray Lord until your purpose and power is released in this world Lord this is our prayer we see it as an answered reality Lord manifested in our own time and generation we pray for we ask it in Jesus name seek ye first the